Okay. Um, thank you all for coming. Beautiful February weather, isn't it? <laughs> um, thank you for being patient with us as we rescheduled this event. Uh, back in February when this was originally supposed to happen, I, I think we had one library staff member who could actually like get out of bed. So um, it, it was quite a challenge to be able to <coughs> just to keep the doors open at that time. Um, before I introduce Jim, I want to talk about, as you, you should have all seen today if you're, if you're a subscriber of the uh, Cortez Journal or the Herald, uh, we had our flyer out about the Cortez Literary Festival um, on June 7th and 8th. Uh, the keynote speaker on Friday night, the 7th, we, will be Ann Hillerman. We're very, very excited about that. Um, and then the next day, Jim will be there the next day as well. We have a <coughs> 25, 30 authors, vendors, who are all going to be in this library. Somehow they're all going to fit in here. Um, <laughs> Cassandra and Kathy have it all figured out. Um, they, but I do believe we, we need three volunteers, Kathy, is that what we're looking for? We're looking for like three more volunteers. And at this point, you know, a pulse is optional. We have, a, we have an AED machine in the back, so we, we can jumpstart you if we need to. Um, so we'll be okay. Um, anyway, thank you, Jim, for coming tonight. Thank you for rescheduling and being patient with us. It was a, it was, it was a, long, a long winter. Um, but, uh, we're, we're all very excited, as you can tell. The turnout on a Friday evening. This is a great crowd. So, um, I think everybody knows Jim. I feel like everybody everybody who I meet in Cortez knows Jim oh, in some oh, way or another. Oh, so, um, I'll, I'll just go over to Jim. Thank you. Sure, right. thank you. Not only do I thank you, but a real hand to Cassandra and Kathy who did all of this. Thank you, ladies. getting all my friends and neighbors here yeah, means a lot to me. I'm happy to see you guys. I'm happy to just hang around. And of course, you know, uh, it makes me very uneasy to speak in public because I, I was only a lecturer for 31 years. And, and when I can be the center of attention, it's a joyful experience. <laughs> so a couple of quick things. I've been asked to remind people to turn off their cell phones. I've also been asked to uh, check out anybody in the audience who's uncomfortable with being videotaped. Um, that uh, they said they would see you in the far corner, over there on the other side of the, sh the shelves. So anybody there, let, let, let everybody know. And that's, that'd be cool. Additionally, I want to point out that uh, you need to be very, very attentive tonight because there will be a 20-question quiz at the end, and if you fail then you'll be expected to chip in for the goodies. <laughs> Pay attention. <coughs> so I've got this kind of <coughs> sort of jocular, sort of uh, relaxed sort of feeling going through me today you know, when I was sort of reviewing what I might do. And even though war can be very dark and very brutal, um, I thought I would start out with um, some more humorous stories with a bit of uh, levity. Are we doing okay here, Doc? <laughs> cool now? Cool now. Okay. Right, right. So, one of the things I thought I might do was select uh, a few more light stories from my book, uh, which, by the way, uh, is my memoirs from the war. And everything in the book is true. Um, names are changed. Uh, and what else should I say? They're not in, it's not in sequence. And I'm jumping back and forth between Okinawa and Thailand. So the background of the whole thing was I was a field maintenance sergeant on B-52 bombers running out of the two largest air bases in the Vietnam War into Vietnam. So I was on the ground. And um, I was actually involved in a B-52 crash, uh, but I was on the ground. I wasn't in the, uh, in the aircraft itself. So the aircraft exploded, and then the bombs that the aircraft that were carrying, those also exploded. Those were 500-pound bombs. So uh, 
I did have an interesting uh, encounter with what I call in the book, uh, The Black Dragon Bird, <clears throat> which leads up to, of course, the title of the book, The Raven and the Dove. But you have to read the book if you want to see who the dove is. So Karen will have it on sale over there, and uh, everybody please line up in an orderly fashion. <laughs> so <clears throat> I thought I might do a little bit of reading, uh, and uh, I want you to sort of give me some feedback. Whenever you've had enough reading and you want me to kind of do sort of create a context and describe, and I'll do a little bit of that as well. That's sound good? Good for some reading? So the first thing I wanted to do was just give you a quick background. So I was 21 years old. I went to the mailbox one day and opened up an envelope and it said, greetings from the President of the United States. And this was, the Vietnam War was really heating up. So um, I decided, well, I think I'd like to learn a trade if I have to do this, so I joined the Air Force. Uh, one of the reasons was I went down to this whole row of recruiters and, and the, it was only the Air Force recruiter that was open that day, so I joined the Air Force. <laughs> <laughs> that goes to show what a, how mature I was at 21. So, basic training in Texas, um, tech school on uh, ground power, aerospace ground equipment at Chinook Air Base, Illinois. Uh, home for Christmas with my mom and directly shipped overseas for a year and a half at Kadena Air Base, Okinawa. I think the first experience I had, the first memory I had of Okinawa was I was standing on a cliff looking out over the South China Sea thinking what have I gotten myself into? Here I am on an island, a rock, hundreds of miles south of Japan out in the ocean, uh, dressing like a pickle every day and having people around me who looked different, spoke differently, everything was very, very unique almost to shock level for a kid who'd never been off the East Coast. So what I decided to do was say, okay, this is what it is, I'll make the best of it, and I decided to go to the university to study Japanese language so at least I could talk to the pretty Asian girls. And so that's what I did. And I'll begin this here then. <laughs> <clears throat> I call this one Bougainville. So when I got good at speaking Japanese, I discovered I was able to find my way around in some areas that were invisible to most of the other airmen. One day I became inquisitive about a parked fleet of older on-base taxis and struck up an acquaintance with Mr. Higa. He was the fleet manager, only to learn that they were for rent by the day. Six bucks. So I began to expand my horizons by wandering north into the jungle where not too many American GIs ventured. Sometime later, the passage of time had become not only unidentifiable, but irrelevant. I found myself cruising along the west coast of Okinawa, up in the higher country, the cliffs on the left. That kind of experience came about then in which the eye caught gets caught by something and the mind just won't let go of it. And that happened to me. There appeared, as I was driving along, these flowers, a sort of red pink flowers, and somehow I felt a, a familiarity with them. So I couldn't pass them by. I just had to stop, I just had to be with these flowers. I parked my car and I just stood, sort of losing myself in these red flowers. So here's this GI in the middle of a war, and we were the enemies, Right? And then the Asian people didn't like us and they're picketing against B-52s. And here I'm standing in this lady's yard, uh, grooving on her red flowers. <laughs> so, just a little bit of background. The Japanese have a whole artistic tradition about the flower, or the hana in Japanese. So, a few years later I was um, living and traveling in Japan as uh, an American exchange student. Actually, I was. Uh, Fort Lewis's first exchange student on the Japan, on the Japan program. And um, at that time, I was invited by a Shinto priest to um, come and be the guest of honor at this dinner, which was designed to um, train young women prior to marriage as to the art of flower arrangement, ikeban. So, <coughs> Uh, kind of an interesting experience because the Japanese are very polite people and uh, since I was the guest they insisted that I arrange the flowers and of course 
Um, you know, th this is a whole science, this is held where art and science meet, man and nature meet, and this is the whole or a very central part of traditional Japanese culture. They said, you, honorable guest, you go ahead and you raise the flower. So I had the slightest idea of what to do. I just jammed stems here and there and handed it to him. And it was, oh, very wonderful flower raising. All the way. Like they're very polite Japanese. Right? So, <coughs> so, I'm going a little bit, when I was, at Fort Lewis College, I took a course from Jim Ash called Medieval Japan Through Art and Literature. And there was a story that I read about a woman who came out in the morning one day, looking to sink her bucket into the well, and there was a morning glory had wrapped itself around the handle of the, bu the bucket. <coughs> and she wrote a poem about Oh, morning glory, how beautiful. And she didn't even bother to get the water because she didn't want to disturb the morning glory, right? <laughs> so that's the Japanese relationship to the, to the flower. And also, um, I have a bit of confession to make. I lived uh, with a family when I was on this exchange program. We lived with a family up in Hokkaido, the northern island. And they were flower farmers. <clears throat> but um, because I had been a unruly GI, um, I had done some LSD, and still, by the time I got to Japan, I was flashing back on acid. So, uh, actually, I had an interesting experience of so hitchhiking the whole length of Japan on acid, which <laughs> was a very strange trip. But at any rate, um, uh, because I was not quite always there, um, they would send me out to to hoe the flowers and. and but one day I hoed down an entire line of their watermelons by mistake. <laughs> and they, they decided, we all decided it would be better if I should just hitchhike away. So, uh, <laughs> As I was doing that, uh, I ran into this guy named uh, Shochan. And what I was doing was I was hitchhiking the length of Japan, stopping at these, uh, these, um, these inns, these youth hostels. And uh, this one guy I was hitchhiking with uh, told me a story about a, a, a historical character, I suspect, though kind of mythological uh, in the Japanese cultural mind. The guy uh, made the mistake of uh, purloining beautiful flowers off of the lawn of some powerful guy who had a lot of political clout in the society. And uh, so he got arrested and thrown in jail and put on trial. But the conclusion was he was so taken with the flower that he could not be prosecuted because everyone in Japan is so carried away by the love of flowers that we can't go around suppressing this kind of behavior. So he got off and, <clears throat> and actually uh, was made sort of a, of a culture hero. So back, <clears throat> back then, flashing, um, flashing back or flashing forward, depending on the acid, um, you, I found myself uh, standing in this lady's yard. And this, they lived in stone houses and they were like rice farmers. And, um, and, but the, the whole wall of her yard had these beautiful flowers, these beautiful bougainville, bougainvillea. And so she, she came out and I kind of came out of my trance and this, this very kindly middle-aged Asian lady inquired in Japanese, um, what are you doing in my yard? <laughs> and I said, I am overtaken by your red flowers. <laughs> and, and so she just smiled. And this was all going on in Japanese, you know. And so I said, I said, my mother grows these flowers in New York. And she just kind of stared at me like, what? And finally I said, what do you call these flowers? And she smiled and said, oh, bokenvira, right? In the Japanese sort of way, you know? So I had this, this experience with this middle-aged Okinawan woman who, just for a moment, uh, everything about gender, race, religion, war, enemies, the whole thing was just completely lost and put aside. 
and we just spent this moment together. This woman who was a stranger, I would never meet her again. And completely in this reverie about red flowers. And here I was a guy in the middle of a war on an island, you know, trying to figure out how to lead my life. So um, I, I was going to kind of read this, but uh, as I sort of went along with it, I remembered the whole story, so I just figured I'd kind of tell you about it. So I, fi I finished it this way. <coughs> For a brief moment, Humanity had shed the burdens of war, the confines of race, the limitations of culture, the suspiciousness of the foreigner, the stranger, the outsider, the enemy, the alien. Even the incomprehensibilities of language and culture had been overridden. For just one moment, we were merely two humans in love with flowers, encountered with the goddess of all things floral. Beauty had predominated, and looking back, I believe the Joint Chiefs of Staff might well have benefited from such a fortuitous but overwhelming encounter. <laughs> so, any, uh, any comments or thoughts on that? How did the Joint Chiefs of Staff do that? That's a big question, you know. Uh, I, uh, I, I don't know how excited they are about Bougainville. You know? <laughs> <laughs> they may not be into botany in the same way that that lady and I were. They kind of live in a different world. Well, so time went on, and you know, when you're in that kind of situation, time really isn't measured quantitatively. But I became interested in uh, in why the people around me did what they did, thought what they thought, felt what they felt. And I became interested in their religion. And I would sometimes be riding a bus or riding my motorcycle around. And I noticed that there were these very elaborate sort of temples. <coughs> so they ended up being what uh, the Japanese called Jinja, which is uh, Shinto, the Shinto temple, as opposed to the Oteta, which is the Buddhist temple. And um, I began to want to hang around there and see why, why people, these strange people who I had been brought into contact with, why they did what they did, how they felt. And so I would occasionally just um, go and hang around in the evening and, and watch people in these temples. And um, at one point, I heard this voice behind me, and he said, uh, this voice said, you, uh, you come here often, don't you? What's the deal with you? You know, turn around, it was the Shinto priest, right? So this was a young man, a young priest. And, and he, he said to me, he said, have, have you ever been to the caves? And uh, what? He said, he said, have you ever been spelunking? You want to see the caves? I thought, I don't know if this guy is up to no good or what, you know? But I figured, he's a Shinto priest, sure, I'll go. So, uh, he took me to the caves and I became more and more interested. The caves are another whole story, but I just want to use it as sort of an entranceway into this little reading that I want to share with you. Because when I went to the caves, I realized how much these guys who I worked with were missing. These guys just basically stayed on base all the time. Mm -hmm. right? They were happy to drink. Occasionally they go down to the rubbles downtown. Or they would, you know, just escape from um, from the base with the security of everybody else on a motorcycle, droves of motorcycles would leave. And I kind of felt these guys were missing something. So when I saw the caves, I thought, next time I go to these caves, I want to bring some of these guys and show them, you know, what a fascinating world there is outside there. So I could kind of start by reading you a little bit of the story of um, how these guys ended up in the caves with me. I actually coaxed them and dragged them and <laughs> bribed them, and, you know, it's going to be okay. And, um, and we all went out, well, there was probably eight or ten of these guys from my outfit who I finally brought up to the caves. So I'll share this a little bit, <clears throat> see if you like it. And so began the tale of these young war heroes romping about down in the darkest caverns of the rock, 
which had been the scene of one of the bloodiest battles of World War II Pacific Theater. A prolonged battle that had taken so many of the lives of American GIs back in their father's generation. And down there, someone would call out, grenade, ahead on your right. We moved gingerly. Choji, the priest, had already briefed the troops. He had said to them as to their mission, its history, and its hazards. When Japanese military know American Navy ships come to attack Okinawa, they back into caves. <coughs> Tanks, trucks, everything. They plan drive out afterwards, meet American army on this land. <coughs> but American Navy gun too big. Just close up caves, cover them over. <coughs> now, no one know where caves. Tank, truck, big gun, many Japanese soldier. Now just sleep forever deep inside rock of Okinawa. With this, my guests had just looked askance at each other, sort of bracing themselves uneasily for whatever was next to come. Slowly then, the descent into darkness was undertaken by the brave troopers of the 4252nd Field Maintenance Squadron of Kadena Air Base, Okinawa. Occasionally, <clears throat> An expletive resounded off the walls, followed by a muffled response. By this time, my comrades obviously had begun to feel quite leery about the whole enterprise, but not wanting to mutually admit any sort of weakness, through misgiving, proceeded down on into the unknown underworld. It was clear that these guys had typically just sort of hung around the airmen's or the NCO clubs and maybe hit the street whores now and then. They were feeling more a little bit more been easy, a bit uneasy about the whole excursion. They were in fact a mite out of their element. Yet, both literally and figuratively, whistling in the dark, they were buoying themselves up through inner reassurance like, we are now Mishki's heroes, the best and the toughest, bravest war heroes of all. Slowly, slowly, we became aware of <coughs> up ahead of us. A large chamber, was this daylight? Ghosts of those soldiers damned to sleep forever in the caves and caverns of rocks of Okinawa? No such luck. It was a set of lanterns borne by a bunch of Japanese guys all conversing in their own language. <coughs> Eyes shifted. The lantern bearers regarded us, Western foreigners, checking each other out for some sort of explanation. What was it, reassurance? Searching? or some sort of familiarity known within a language far from the present circumstance, longing maybe for some sense of comfort offered within the converse, conversational milieu. Superstition faded fast as Shoji greeted the busy blush of buoyant bug puffs. Oh, I forgot to tell you. The reason we're going there <laughs> is that Shoji had been uh, approached by a professor from uh, Tokyo University, a major Japanese university. And this guy was an entomologist, right, studying insects. And he was writing his doctoral dissertation of all things, talk about focus, about spiders that lived on the walls of caves in Okinawa. Right? He's going to do his doctoral dissertation. So we approached this priest right, and said, can you get a crew together to flip spiders into little vials of alcohol. Right? <laughs> so that's what that's what we're doing here. I've got to tell you. So <clears throat> somewhat taciturn, formal recognition followed, and summarily, we, the reinforcements, brave new heroes of the insect investigation squad, were assigned our duties within the dark reaches of the underworld. The daring aeromechanics of patriotic imperialism were now set about the business of questing for strange, creepy creatures within the corners of the cavernous. Sensing this sort of improbability, even the outlandishness of the mission at hand, but now beginning to laugh and shout with exhilaration at each new arachnid find, my airmen buddies, having forgotten all of their misgivings of place and purpose, now with all possible dispatch and stamina, had embarked upon the task at hand with serious endeavor, administering their assignments, gleefully revisiting back in complete abandon to Dr. Ono, Shoji's buddy, 
the mad spider, spider scientist of Nippon, requisitioning more test tubes and flicking the poor blind creatures into the alcohol or formaldehyde, proudly showing off their latest finds all under the watchful eye of the PhD candidate from the mainland, holding up their discoveries almost in the face of the man who as well was feeling and a rising instability in the <laughs> What now was to be made of this strange arrangement of multicultural personnel having foisted upon him with this dissident, inharmonious legion of untutored, voluntary spider gleaners? <laughs> this really happened. It was all out of the reach of any sort of regularity. It was, in fact, downright enigmatic. <clears throat> I had lived around East Asian, fo Asian, Asian folks long enough to catch the bewilderment on the face of the bemused but puzzled little university scholar, now possibly laboring equally far out of his own cultural element. Hey, Doc, check this one out, man, came the resounding reports of young aircraft mechanics, Americans proudly displaying their most recent entomological detec detections seemingly seeking the applause of admiration and acknowledgement of their diligent discoveries down in the dark, dank desolation of the draconian depths. <laughs> I like alliteration. <laughs> Maybe you can tell. <clears throat> and then, Dr. Ono, strangely enough, in light of the typically reserved personality characteristic of the sons of Nippon, himself began to find infectious this outlandish, <laughs> fervent fever. At first, his responses were offered in forms, in forms I've sometimes heard refer, referred to as very Japanesey. Paul, oh, thank you very much. <laughs> With that small but certain bow, a legacy of the indigenous feudal society that had so long stood under the sway of daimyo and his samurai. Live for your emperor. Most Japanese folks hold on to their cultural reserve with white-knuckle tenacity, and admirably so. But as fascinated with his spiders as the doc obviously was, devoting his life to the cause of critiquing creepy crawly creatures, his culturally reinforced detention of affect began to crack. This overwhelmed, dignified scientist from the land of the rising sun was rendering all possible attempts to keep his cool struggling to maintain that composed reserve of classical Japanese politeness and apropos responses. Yet now, having been thrust into a wildly unique situation that was becoming increasingly unwieldy, it was clear that unpredictability was to override the proposed controlled demeanor of the day. <laughs> so, get ready, ladies and gentlemen. At first, desperately adhering to classical cultural sanctioned responses like onigashimasu, which means please do it for me, the in inapplicability of such phrases under the present ambient culture in cultural incongruence, having intensively waxed turbulent, and now beginning to break down, began finally giving way to an implosive meltdown of all conditioned formality. As a more functional, newly constructed neurocircuitry began bursting itself into existence through such expletives as oh very wonderful american kugu tai o toko which means uh, american here <clears throat> i leaned back forgetting the flask in my hand here before me i ruminated lies a tree display of true adaptability. The highly conditioned cultural rejoinders providing neither applicable nor bearable, a sort of semantic Americanization had begun to show itself within the Asian entomologist. Dysfunctional, uh, oh, who, feeling his way along in his own situationally dysfunctional, dysfunctional interior darkness, had begun negotiating between cultural inner and immediate outer voices, reinventing himself on the fly, but the seat of his pants, an anomaly of tradition, ranking of the first order. Meanwhile, back in the American cultural psyche, bilaterally, a 
collective comprehension of the whole display of ethnographic and grammatical morphology was likewise underway. <laughs> Transition. Oh, I, 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 love, I love the way you just did this, Robbie. <laughs> You're cool. <clears throat> Transition to the realm of previously uninvented verbal behavior, having been somewhat intuitively recognized by the investigative troops, chuckles began morphosing into emissions of guffaws, finally ejaculating into out-and-out -out hilarity, echoing back and forth within the cavernous walls of the Okinawan substratum. And all through the hollows and grooves of that grotto of gleeful gala and grand custom. Do you like alliteration? <laughs> a somewhat, somewhat ecstatic cross-cultural orgasm of pure excitement had, for one sublime moment, been achieved under a most astonishing cultural and linguistic exegesis. At length, this senior academic, academic from Todai, Tokyo University, began just chattering with these ruffian-type lower-middle-class American airmen in a delightfully hilarious, broken sort of English uh, polyglot, filling in the blanks of the contrived dialogue with what he imagined would be appropriate or even somewhat relevant to his audience of war-hardened but wholehearted zero researchers. A new sort of semantics was arising right on the spot, so when the enthusiastic junior Arachnolog Arachnologist began to come running up to Ono Sensei, the teacher, with duplicate specimens wound up by each other's mutually goading glee, whereupon at first Dr. Odo, ono had reciprocated with a bow responding, To Onaji means the same, you already did that, right? <laughs> to the growing duplications of delightful discovery. The calamity saw the senior researcher beginning to engender a sort of jarring of collective cultural memory as an historically evolved common verbiage of English speakers, the same sort of GI Japanese barroom girl polyglot English that had evolved with post-World War II occupation troops. Same old, same old. Okay? The Japanese girls were always having insisted about building it into a lexic lexical equation. Same old, same old. Right? And later, when brought back by some of these GIs to the States, it subsequently became what we say, same old, same old, that's where it came from. Right? From same, same, same old, same old, same old, same old. Don't ever forget. <laughs> A duplicate cultural interface began. Once again, to be enacted, uh, reenacted by this cavernous, multilingual, investigative, academic, zoological discord. It all generated to an intense upsurge of increasing infectiousness, spreading throughout the cavern, building up to a cacophonous crescendo. The more enthused the actors became, the more the exhilaration arose into reinforcing the upward spiral, voicing itself into a climatic high-toned manifestation of collective exhilaration. The whole damn subterranean cavity experienced the arising into a howling roar of self-generated arachnid-seeking mirth and merriment. <laughs> and then, then, all parties, all at once, simultaneously, having become aware of the ridiculousness and the incongruence and preposterousness of this overwhelming glee, pandemonium of the entire scenario, broke into an immediate and stony silence, regarding each other with a strange air of mutual standoffishness. Silence. Everyone looked around, considering each other, askance, with strange glances of curiosity and dismay, and then, retreating finally, internally into a sort of self-protective introversion, concluded the collective awakening with an orchestrated <sighs> Scientists took their stations once again. Airmen regained their military composure. Culture and ex expectations had taken hold once again, and things had returned to their commonplace equilibrium of the wearisome, humdrum norm of expectation and fulfillment. <clears throat> Emiko was my girlfriend over there. Though Emiko and I had been 
all along, swinging with the whole state of affairs, we had also become somewhat of an onlooking audience. In the months to come, we were to review that strange state of affairs together many times, often regaining with delight the hilarity of it. Still, I am very sure my comrades in arms, those of them who are still breathing, are now and then sipping a cold one in some bar room in the Midwest or the South, and in the embellishment of their half lives, hearkening back to their Okinawan spider cape days. <laughs> Incongruous with their character, though they most certainly were, as the calls for war stories inevitably arise, as they eternally do, within the noisy halls of American Legion's post, coast to coast, in the land of the free and the home of the brave. <laughs> So that, these are some sort of gleeful moments that, uh, you know, interspersed the dark periods of the war. So, we could go in a couple of directions. I could, uh, uh, I have another sort of funny story about um, a, uh, an ex-FBI agent, FBI agent, air police sergeant, and Chicago cop who I, um, turned on to marijuana for the first time in his life before we went to the movies to see um, uh, to, to see one of these spy movies way back in those days. And, and so all of the fun we had in the movies as he got lost in the movies and that kind of thing. So I could read you that or we could go take a more serious bent now and talk a little bit about the, uh, the darkness and the disasters of the war. Some of the things that maybe the American public uh, never got a hold of. <coughs> so you want to hear about James Bond or you want to hear about, um, you want to hear about, uh, Well, it sounds like we have to take a vote. <laughs> Okay, well, okay, let me clarify a little bit. When, when I talk about the real war, what I'm really wanting to help people look at is how the forces of the American empire, in my opinion, betrayed the American people and caused a major weakening of America uh, it, under a situation in Southeast Asia that could have been prevented had statesmanship and wisdom and maturity and dedication to one's people been the driving force and factor in terms of how this, the Vietnam War, how Southeast Asia would have gone. So that, that's what I would be talking about there. Okay. And uh, in terms of the movie scene, um, it's sort of another sort of humorous thing that actually happened. Uh, and a um, very interesting guy. This guy had, was a, had a background of an FBI agent and I was in basic training with him. And um, we stumbled across some KKK people in the, uh, in the outfit. So, which way should we go? Everybody who wants to hear about the statesmanship and the darkness of the war and some commentaries, raise your hand. Okay. And everybody who wants to hear about all of the uh, grand goings on in this theater in Chicago, when I'm stoned with the FBI agent, I mean, <laughs> but, uh, you know what, <laughs> buddy, he, he's, he's a fellow Vietnam veteran. I've so, read the book too. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you're out of the book. But, um, oh, one thing I do want to say is that I really enjoy talking about this kind of thing. So I have my, my business card up there on the table. So when you go and buy three or four books at a time from the table, um, you can pick up one of my cards and give me a call and I enjoy um, cracking a beer and just talking about more stories that are in the book. So don't be shy, you'll have my phone number. Call me and we can continue because I, I enjoy this kind of thing. I, I like talking. <laughs> I know you'd never guess. <laughs> okay. So, I think I'll begin this way. I 
came in one night, went to bed. I'd been out carousing downtown doing something or other that GIs do. And the CQ, uh, charge of quarters, he's the guy who, uh, and it's a rotating um, responsibility. He's in charge of the barracks. He represents the commander, like uh, looks out for fires, stuff like that, you know, make sure that everything's okay. Woke me up. He said, the, the colonel wants everybody down on the flight line. So, after going back to sleep for a while, I thought, well, maybe they'll take attendance. I'm going to show up. So I, I go down there, and here's officers and enlisted men all mixed together. You don't see that happen much. And they're all looking up in the sky, like they're waiting for flying saucers to come or something. And this went on for a long time. Nobody's saying much, but I said to my buddy, you know, what's up? And he said, rumor has it that the North Koreans commandeered an American naval vessel and, uh, and LBJ is hot to try. So we keep looking and as dawn comes out of the east in this red, cloud, red formation of clouds, these black dots appear and get bigger and bigger. And I had worked, I mean, that was my job. I worked around B-52s all the time. <clears> there <throat> was just waves after waves of B-52s coming in. And up to that time, as far as official treaty was concerned, the United States and Japan had an agreement that there would be no nuclear weapons on Japanese soil as a result of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I watched the first beef, beef, I watched the first acknowledged nuclear weapon touch Japanese soil since World War II as the first B-52 carrying a 20 megaton warhead under each wing landed, taxied, and did not turn off the engine and just sat there with the engine running and then more and more and more waves of B-52s until the entire flight line was filled with B-52s, engines running, 20 megaton warheads under each wing. Think about what a 20 megaton warhead, that is so vastly more powerful than anything that was ever dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Those were just tiny compared to a 20 megaton warhead. And then the story was out, right, that in fact, it was the Pueblo incident. <clears throat> you guys remember the Pueblo incident? <clears throat> I'm not sure that it ever really got to the news, to, uh, the news media or in the papers, that uh, as those engines sat there running, LBJ made the decision whether he was going to, say, get them. And later on, in the, in the book, there's some initial documentation in terms of the conferences that LBJ had with his cronies and colleagues deciding what to do, uh, a number of plans included attacking uh, North Korea with nuclear weapons, which would have probably meant that we would have burned alive a quarter of a million North Korean children, which I don't think is a really good idea. And I finally watched the engine shut off as LBJ called it and said, stand down. And that was, I think, one of the most serious, darkest experiences I had. Realizing what empire will do in order to maintain its position in the world. I mean, I had seen what the presence of American military forces in Southeast Asia, and, and indeed Okinawa, had done to this to society, had done to the economy, had done to the you know, of demolishing the world of simple people who just worked in rice fields. Um, just just a quick example. There's a much longer story in the book. <clears throat> there was a young guy in our outfit named Billy from Iowa. He was just one of these really innocent kids. Did, did any of you people see uh, Legends of the Fall? Do you remember the uh, the young 
the young brother who the two bro uh, older brothers looked after. Well, it was like that. We sort of looked after this kid. And I'm working on an engine with this kid one day, and he's telling me about an experience he had where he sees this beautiful young Thai woman, young woman, and he figures, well, in, in uh, Iowa, I would invite her to go to the movies, so I'll invite her to go to the movies in Thailand, right? And of course, the young woman has no idea what the hell he's talking about at all. And finally says, you have to talk to my father about this. I don't know, I don't know about this. So, to make a long story short, he proceeds with this young woman to a hut by a rice field where she and her family live. And the young woman explains as best she can to her father what this young airman wants to do. He wants to take me to the movies, and it's all about aliens that are going to take over the earth where we fight them all. You know, the Thai, the, the, the Thai rice farmers would certainly understand the whole thing. <laughs> and lots of talking back and forth with the Thai people in this little hut. And the answer comes back through the young woman to Billy. My father says, no, you may not take me to the movies, but you may buy me for $50. Oh, That's the kind of impact that the American military was making on the economy of these simple people, right? I mean, it, it was everywhere. And to move maybe now a little closer, in this very library, right over there, I read maybe 10 letters that Ho Chi Minh wrote to President Truman. Ho Chi Minh's heroes were Washington and Lincoln. He had pictures of them on his desk. They were his heroes, his mentors. And he was writing to Truman to say, look, I am in agreement with your political philosophy. Democracy is the way people should live. Help me, work with me to build a democratic society in Southeast Asia. We can make it contagious. We can make it move into Laos. We can make it move into Cambodia, right? We can start something beautiful for the world in Southeast Asia. I read it right there. The English was lousy, but it was comprehensible. And he wrote it to Truman. Truman never answered. It's, it's pretty clear that he saw the letters. But what the deal was is that the French were saying to Truman, we want you, as we move out of Southeast Asia, based upon the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, where they were de destroyed, where the French military was defeated by the, uh, the Viet Minh, Right? We want you to come in, and we want you to fill up the vacuum. Otherwise, America, we're going to go with the Russians. And the whole deal then, in the minds of Washington bureaucrats, was domino theory. Oh, you know, if, if oh, Vietnam will fall, and then Cambodia will fall, Laos will fall, Thailand will fall, Burma will fall, oh my god, you know, they'll all be communists, and we'll be surrounded. Nothing could have been further from the truth. <coughs> In the year AD 400, AD 40, sorry, two Vietnamese women, the Trung sisters, led a rebellion against the Chinese masters that had conquered these people long before, threw off the Chinese yoke, and had an experience of freedom for a relatively short period of time. My basic point here is that the, the Vietnamese hated the Chinese for centuries. They despised the Chinese, wanted to get anything negative in the direction of China. There was no chance at that time in history of Vietnam ever going with China. And my point is that the decisions were made to keep certain positions of empire in place out of certain sorts of forms of fear and ignorance, racism being a major part of it, 
And instead of holding democracy as a principle, they held power and security and alliances and natural resources, etc., etc., as the principle, as the guiding principle in the history of American involvement in Southeast Asia. And that cost America 60,000 lives, right? 160,000 wounded, and the wounds were much more brutal than World War II. Weaponry had been devised on both sides to be just horrible. I mean, we, for instance, set up uh, weapons in the jungle that were um, heat sensitive. So if a rabbit scurried through the jungle, go, go, and just anything that moved was just blown away. Right? Terrible weapons. 160,000 wounded. And by the time the war was over, a million and a half Southeast Asian people lay dead. And for what? Nothing ever came of it that was really beneficial to America, except maybe that certain presidents, and I'm, I'm not going Republican, Democrat, I'm not going liberal, conservative, all of them, regardless of their, politi of their political persuasion, they didn't want to look bad. They didn't want to be the one, the president who was off in office when the Vietnam War was lost, so they just kept shuffling GIs into the, into the meat grinder. And it weakened America. It's changed America. Right? I do think that if anything should be taken away with my book, or this talk, or our talks over beer in the future, it should be the considered idea that the greatest enemy that we're facing is empire. Right? That there are forces that are going to be damned if they're going to let go of their power, their privilege, mm -hmm. right, their position, right, and my opinion is that these are my enemies, right, and I argue here that we were betrayed by our leaders. We were betrayed by our leaders out of uh, lust for power, out of ego, out of desire for. Uh, a great position in history rather than love for their people. Mm -hmm. And I think we are suffering the results of that today. And that's one, that's sort of the second half of the book where I talk about my experiences with empire. And a lot of it ended up being research that I did, some of it right, right here in this library, uh, in terms of what really happened and what seems to be somewhat unknown. I have never been able to really uh, run down in the news media anything about um, the B-52s that came in from Montana that I saw on the runway with the 20 megaton warheads. So my argument is that, that this can be a lesson for all of us. It can be a lesson for the world. Uh, for me, it was a strange experience. Uh, it, I came of age in wartime, in Asia, overseas, and, and grew a lot from that experience. But the, the difficult thing is, I grew a lot, and it was a major thing that helped me grow and change and get strong, or I would have died. But uh, how do you say, oh, what a lovely war, right? It, and, and every GI I talk to, <laughs> has that same kind of response. Um, I'm not going to read it. Uh, I, can, I can leave it on the desk. It's a buddy of mine. He lives in Grand Junction. He was a chopper pilot in Nam, blown out of the air three times by mortars, uh, severe PTSD, and he, he lives with the same kind of thing. You know, this, I have, he has no ability to really understand why that had to happen and what to do about it except that he gets very nervous when people say, thank you for your service to our country, sir. So, um, it's now seven o'clock, uh, and uh, Eric, are we uh, thinking about doing question-answer stuff? Huh?
sure people have questions. So. So, um, do you guys want to do some discussion stuff? Sure. Go. <laughs> what, what, what do you want to talk about? Have I, have I stimulated anything that, that would oh, yeah. be useful? Yeah. I kind of think all of us here have had some contact with the Vietnamese War. Yeah. My brother served twice, mm -hmm. retired as a colonel now. Right. Biders, brother was in the CIA during that time and worked out of Laos and in South Vietnam. Yeah. I think we all have family members that must have been through there. Yeah. 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 And none of them will talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's kind of, two years ago I just sat down and remembered some stuff and started writing and they turned into chapters and then I had a great editor if anybody knows Jennifer Hope in this town, she's just a grand lady and a super editor. And she uh, she worked with me on that book, and finally she said it's ready to go. And I was very lucky. I uh, I sent it out to a number of uh, publishers, and a publishing company in New York City picked it up within a few weeks because I think it was on the American mind with the uh, <coughs> the, the stuff that was uh, on uh, PBS. And um, I don't know why, but anyway. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Back to yes, sir. Well, you know, I've always been curious about. Uh, how did, 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 should we get a microphone for here? Uh -huh. yeah. I, I said I've, I've always been curious about Vietnam. I uh, graduated from high school in 1967. I went to a fairly large high school, had about 2,000 people in it. But uh, you know, other than my cousin, who was went to the Citadel and was a captain in the Marine Corps, I just really don't know anybody that was actually in combat in Vietnam. Most of my friends who went to Vietnam, and they flunked out of college and, or had a very low draft number and joined the Air Force or the Navy. One of my friends joined the Navy. He had an idea that when he got his stuff back together, he would want to go into medicine. And uh, so he uh, became the Navy corpsman, not knowing that the Marines were part of the Navy, so he actually wound up uh, in <coughs> Vietnam. But long and short of it was that uh, I don't know anybody that was in combat in Vietnam. Who, who were the Charlie Sheen, uh, Tom Hanks, uh, <coughs> Matthew Modine people in Vietnam? Because I've never met any of them except for my my cousin, who was a, an actual captain and was uh, was a gung ho marine. Sir. Yeah, um, I went through the post office. <coughs> I'd say like seventy percent of the postal workers came out of Vietnam when I was in, went into the post office in 1971. Those were who were in combat. People who, you know, high school graduates. And that would have been it, and they were rural people. I was living in Maine, and so they were rural people, and they grew up with a culture that you did serve, and they went off. And some of them, all of them would talk to us about it in small groups. Most of them never would talk about it in a big group like Jim is now. I can't imagine any of them doing it. But I think if you go out and look at your old post workers and things like that, you'll see a lot of people who were in combat. That's my take on that. Would that be true, Mike? Uh, I'm an ex-postal worker also. I was in Vietnam era. I was in and started in the Navy in the early 60s, so I wasn't part of the Vietnam War because we had on the ground uh, and preparing for that era. The ship I was on is, is part of the Cuban Missile Blockade in 1962. Mm -hmm. So it brings up the idea of nuclear weapons uh, in harm's way in America, in, in the world, uh, in the world view, being part of the uh, partners. Uh, the Soviets, <coughs> right then, the Soviets in America. 
struggling for nuclear power. Certainly, Empire. Yeah. Empire. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. um, I guess as as in reference to this, my my father uh, went into the to the service uh, for World War II. He went in and did not go into the theater, but then he was in the Korean War. He was on Okinawa. And um, I don't know about a lot of you or a lot of other people, my father never spoke of the war. Um, he, the only thing that he spoke about were the Okinawan people and how wonderful they were, but he never spoke of any type of um, battle or that kind of thing. Yeah, well, for everybody who's in the field, there's a bunch of people that are back up. And that's just the way the military works. So, I mean, it, it wasn't a piece of cake, but you know, I, I was never under fire, though I you know, did survive a bomber crash. It was uh, pretty strange. <clears throat> oh, uh, yes, yes, sir. You mentioned that the leaders were responsible for what happened in that era. What about us as elected, you know, people that elect the leaders? I and mean, how does that, I mean, isn't there a factor there that plays into what happened and the messes that we got into? I mean, we're a democracy, so our leaders are people that we elect. There certainly is. There certainly is a responsibility. And I, I, uh, I think you, you deepen the argument by bringing that in, and, and I, I I heartily agree with your point. What is it about the human race that makes us so complacent with violence, so complacent with war, so willing to step forward and take orders when that may mean that a lot of people are going to get killed? You know, we seem to venerate that a lot. We seem to think that that's okay. You know, I don't have any responsibility. If the state says it's okay to kill, I'm going to kill. Why do, why do we do that? And why, and why, you know, maybe it goes back to our DNA, right? I mean, I mean we're, you know, we're, we're hunters, you know? And uh, I think, well, I won't go into that, but um, I think that we see, we have seen in the history of our species, that as we stopped hunting and directing that death instinct toward animals, we started turning it on ourselves. Not that there hasn't always been tribes that have fought against each other, but now these tribes are getting bigger and bigger, more and more complex, and, and we really are inventors. We're really tool makers, and we are, from the little that I'm hearing since the Vietnam War, we are really making these weapons even more complex, more dangerous, and more terrible. Now, I agree with you, we are responsible, and that's one of the reasons that I wanted to come talk a little bit. Yeah. Yes, sir, I agree. Sir? I think if we're told a lie often enough, <clears throat> it becomes true. <clears throat> and I think we are fed to be nice and alive uh, fairly frequently. Yeah. Or at least a nuance on an actual fact, but with a different result. Yeah, and <clears throat> to their credit, and, and I had nothing to do with it, um, people were marching in the streets. It was enough of uh, Daniel Ellsberg's uh, information coming out that people were beginning to say, hey, you know, we're not getting told the truth here, and we don't want any more of our young men being chopped up. And I, to their credit, people were marching in the streets and shutting down the Vietnam War. You know, Nixon, for one, was looking out the windows of the White House saying, oh my God, you know, what's happening to America? I don't want to take any credit for that because that was something that I was hearing about from thousands of miles away mm -hmm. while I was overseas. You know, it, I mean, it didn't really strike me until I came home and, and went to college. You know, for instance, AFRTS, the Armed Forces Radio and Television Service, um, Kent State, remember Kent State, where they shot down the students? What came across AFRTS was um, uh, some uh, college students were shot in a campus in Ohio, and now the ball scores. That was, <laughs> right? It was news control. 
right? It's empire. I, I really would urge us to begin to think about if we have to have an enemy, it may be about to be empire. You know, maybe we ought to be doing something to m at least modify it. Now, Eisenhower was the one that said, beware the military industrial so in response to what you're saying, let me just read this. Every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies, in a final sense, a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and not clothed. This world in arms is not spending money alone. It is spending the sweat of its laborers, the genius of its scientists, the hopes of its children. This is not a way of life at all in any true sense. Under the cloud of threatening war, it is humanity hanging from a cross of iron. Oh, it's from cross. No. Eisenhower's yeah. speech, yeah. The Chance for Peace, in April 1953, upon the death of uh, Stalin. Mm -hmm. That's what Eisenhower had to say. And he was a five-star general. Yeah. How come we're not listening to people like that? I don't know. What he did manage to get done was he guided the money into our interstate system. Yes, he did. System. Yes, he did. So yes, he did. that could be done again. You know, we have lots of things to fix. Yeah. We have lots of things to fix, and they're not all tangible. You know, some of it is, what the hell's wrong with our thinking? You, know, you just want to that. That would work. Right. Yes. I guess you have to look from a different perspective because I protested the war. Yes. I mean, I didn't go to the Capitol or anything like that, but I was out protesting against it. Yes. And then I dated someone who was a vet and was in drafted in the war and went and fought. And he would not ever speak of anything to me about it. And I didn't really understand that at the time. But as the years went past, I understand things a little better like that. Um, for those people that actually were over there fighting like mm -hmm. that, it's very difficult for them to speak to anyone that did not experience what they experienced. Yeah. So sometimes, and I'm not saying all the time, they can talk to other people that went through the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. But most of the time, they can't speak of it at all to anyone else. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's just no common ground yeah. Yeah. between you know, somebody that's never you know, been in the war. Yeah. But like I said, it's all in a perspective because I protested it and I'm a vet. Yeah. I wasn't in that war or anything, mm -hmm. but I am a vet. Yes. And I think back about it and I think, well, mm -hmm. those people probably thought that I was protesting against them. And that's not how I saw it. I was protesting us being in the war. Yes, yes, of course. I was still proud <coughs> of those people that went over there and fought for their country. They thought they were doing what they were supposed to, and a lot of them drafted and stuff had no choice unless they just ran off and, you know, and shirked their responsibility and ran off. You know, some people just yeah. can't handle it mm -hmm. and ran off and. Right dodged the draft, but it's like, <coughs> I don't know if you, because I feel like, you know, if they were looking at me when I'm out there, oh, we need to get out of this war and stuff, you know, I hope that they don't feel that, that I was protesting against them, but I think some of them did. They saw, probably on the news or whatever, they saw the people protesting, and they thought it was, you know, it was an insult to them. Well, um, I mean, I've had people tell me that I've had, I've talked to vets that were in that war, 
And some of them tell me that, and, they, and, and I'm like, oh, I shouldn't tell them I was you know, doing that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but I usually do tell them, but I say this is how I felt yeah. about it. Yeah. I still, you know. It, I understand your quandary. Uh, I, uh, even while in uniform, was a member of Viet the Vietnam Veterans Against the War. And you had to be very careful. You, you can't say <laughs> You but, can't say that. That's, that's like, I know, I'm a vet. Uh, there were things that I protested against when... So you and I are heretics. I mean, in my head when I was serving, but you, you aren't allowed to say that kind of thing. You know, that's like, kind of like dressing. Or something. Yeah. Well, based upon what you're saying, I decided that I might read what my buddy wrote. This came across uh, email to me this week, and I don't think he knew I was going to do any of this. Um, it just synchronistically happened. This is the guy who I told you about who was the chopper pilot in Nam, who got blown out of the air three, three times. He didn't even have to go back um, after he got blown out once. He could have gotten a, a, a discharge but he said it was survivor's guilt and he went back for two more rounds, right? So um, he, he, sent, he sent this to me um, and it's got a lot of different points of view in it, but I think you might appreciate it. I think everybody might appreciate it in view of what's being said here. I'll share it with you. This is called In My Country's Name. I hear it said now and again, thank you for your service. I mumble thanks somewhat awkwardly like a chain, chance meeting with an ex-in-law. It's been so long. Haven't you forgotten? I haven't, I can't. The war, you know, the Vietnam War. I'm, I'm old now. Soon there'll be nothing to remember, nothing to forget. I saw things, selfless acts of bravery, unimaginable horror, faces and names of men, boys. They were whose lives, some lost, many changed in ways that can't be comprehended unless you were there. It was the summer of love back home. Music, fast cars, drugs, and that annoying news reminding you that friends, neighbors, Americans were getting wounded or killed. And the part you didn't want to think about <clears throat> was in your name. Oh, sure, you did your part. You marched and protested, smoked some pot, blamed the politicians, the ones our country voted for. <clears throat> but to make the soldiers out as fools, stooges, or worse, baby killers. Don't you remember the Oxford Union, England, 1933? Quote, we shall not fight and die for king and country, end of quote, while Hitler <coughs> was making plans to destroy their very country. Oh, you didn't know that? There is something sacred when a man puts on a uniform knowing that it might cost him his life. He does it in your name. It is up to you. It always has been to make sure it's not in vain. <clears throat> but I digress. My point is to remember to never forget. Tom, you will see his name on the helicopter in Fruta. Pierce, my roommate is in uh, flight school, Bigelow, Coffin, Whittington, and so many more. To fly straight into the gunfire, not turn away, to bring out comrades because they would die if you didn't. I say this in part because my country worries me right now. I fear that we are like the students at Oxford Union. War is so out of fashion. We live in a global village. Can't we all just get along? War is a tragedy, not to be stumbled into foolishly. But remember the words of Leon Trotsky, quote, you may not want war, but war may want you. And if it happens again, you will be sending soldiers in your name. And by the way, if you chance to see me, please don't say thank you for your service. Maybe say, God bless you. God bless us all. Thank you. That's what he had to say. <coughs> Final thoughts? Discussion? <laughs> I'll read you one more thing. <laughs> This is, this is a thought 
that keeps reverberating within me as a result of everything that happened to me, everything that I wrote about, everything the book is about, and what I think what I'm really wanting to share here. Short quote from a guy named Leopold Kor. This is from the Breakdown of Nations. Thank you for coming. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. That's our web. Take good care. Breakdown of Nations. Very short. Please think of this. For whenever a nation becomes large enough to accumulate the critical mass of power, it will in the end accumulate. And then when it has acquired it, it will become an aggressor. Its previous record and intentions to the contrary not the same. You know, we started out with, you know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. All men are created equal, right? Endowed by the creator with inalienable rights, and everybody's going to vote, and everybody's going to be free, and everybody's going to pursue happiness. And then somehow or other, some forces moved in, right? And it became about who can accumulate power, who can accumulate money, who can be on top, who can look good, right? All of this. It's empire, and my message to you is that's our enemy, and I hope that you'll go home tonight thinking about that. Anything else? Don't forget there's goodies and cookies, and if you fail the test, then you have to pay for the cookies. <laughs> and uh, I'm selling books. So I want you to read my books, and I want you to then take my card, and then call me up, and uh, invite me for a beer, and we'll talk some more. You guys are beautiful. Thanks for coming. This is really fun for me. I really love it. It's great to have fun.